I'm going to be talking to John Lee, who is a technology analyst for UK-based ID Tech X, about a new report about uh, fuel cell electric vehicles out to 2045. So welcome to the interview, John. Thanks a lot for having me, Markham. It's good to be here. Um, I want to set some context here because two, three years ago, I had Michael Liebrick on uh, for an interview. And many people will remember him from Bloomberg uh, New Energy Finance. And uh, I was a lot more bullish about hydrogen at that time. And he basically punctured my illusions about where hydrogen was going to go. Cost, difficulty in transport, uh, difficulty producing it. Uh, so my take on that was, okay, let's see what the hydrogen industry can do. Let's see what the use cases are as we begin to experiment. And of course, transportation was held up as one of the big demand centers it hasn't worked out that way, has it? No, definitely. And what I'd say is a couple of years ago, I probably would have been in the same boat as you. Um, I mean, it's easy to sing the praises of hydrogen if you get it from the right sources and it's easy to transport. And yeah, as a zero emissions tra transportation method, it's obviously very, it's on paper, it's really good. But even this year, when we looked at what we've seen in the market recently, both in terms of infrastructure and on the side of vehicles development, but you have to say that it's not looking as good as it was a couple of years ago. And I think this is the general consensus in industry and also with other analysts who I speak to as well. Sure. And I think the big problem here is the fueling infrastructure, because I, I remember interviewing a couple of years ago, one of the hydrogen uh, companies in Vancouver, uh, Vancouver, Canada has a hydrogen cluster. Uh, yes. And he said at that time that it was economic to ship hydrogen, maybe a hundred uh, kilometers. And that was it. And so I came to the conclusion that in transportation, uh, you, there was no point building out a fueling infrastructure, you know, pipelines and, and production facilities. It would have to be an, in, uh, an electrolyzer, basically where you're going to refuel, that's where you'd have to make the uh, make the hydrogen, but that hasn't turned out to be feasible either, has it? No, definitely. And I think uh, even though I'd say hydrogen as an infrastructure has gotten a lot of support from local governments, a lot of them still remain in these sort of clusters or trials or pilots. And I guess the first reason is, and from what we've seen, for example, even in China, from what I've seen, a lot of these supposed stations they claim to have aren't even necessarily running right now. Uh, and it's to do with, I guess, the upkeep, the capex, and also just not having enough vehicles actually such that you're only if you're only refueling 20 vehicles for a day, for example, whether they're trucks, buses, or passenger cars, it's just not, it's not really taken off. And like you say, transport for hydrogen still remains a massive question. The pipeline construction, I think globally, we're probably still only a few thousand kilometers, again, concentrated in certain regions. And so on-site electrolyzer sounds great, but in practice, it's not been, we've not seen as much progress as we might have expected, no. Let's talk about Stellantis because it's a big uh, OEM auto manufacturer and it recently discontinued its fuel cell technology development program. Why did it do that? Um, so speaking about Stellantis, because everyone knows Stellantis, I think it's just, it's incredibly relevant because they mentioned that they saw no short to medium term opportunity for hydrogen as a transportation method. I think the big thing with Stellantis is that they were developing fuel cell technology for their light commercial vehicles. And so on the one hand, it's important to mention that just because they're discontinuing that doesn't necessarily mean it's over for fuel cells. And we don't necessarily see it at light commercial vehicles as where we want hydrogen to take off um, is what I would say. But it's a massive statement from a massive OEM, essentially saying that there's no infrastructure right now. There's not going to be many opportunities and this is not going to sell. And if, if they who are so close to collaborating with the infrastructure and also the logistics companies that will be using this have said that, then I think that's a massive statement for the industry as a whole that we need to possibly rethink our strategies and see what we can do going forward. Yeah, it, it seems to be the competition here, obviously, is from battery electric trucks and, and, and vehicles. And it seems like, you know, BEVs 
have a major infrastructure advantage over hydrogen because electricity is everywhere. And you can build out, you know, like if you're a, a fleet operator, uh, you can build a charging infrastructure relatively easy and inexpensively on your premises. Uh, but doing that with hydrogen would be quite expensive and prohibitively so. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree with you there. Uh, I think there is still some concerns until sort of upgrading your grid. If you're locally trying to get that much electricity, especially if we're talking about battery electric trucks, which are going to have, uh, first of all, they need to be running for a long time during the day, so they can't be charging at very slow rates. And also with battery capacities of hundreds of kilowatt hours, necessarily getting sort of megawatt levels of charging is still expensive. And what we, from what we've seen, still can take an a long amount of time but it's undoubtedly true that electrical electric charging and bev charging infrastructure is so much further ahead years ahead of what we can see from hydrogen if hydrogen ever reaches that point let's talk about some of the uh the applications so light duty vans and cars uh, maybe light duty trucks um really are not taking off toyota has a mirai that's had you know when you say modest sales would be, I think, a generous way to describe it. And Honda has a CRV that's a fuel, fuel cell. It's even has sales that are lower yet. It, it just hasn't taken off on, on passenger vehicles, has it? No, absolutely not. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. But I mean, the big thing is, even if you and I were really all in on hydrogen, it's possible that we would have no way to refuel it anyway. Uh, certainly that's the case in the UK where public hydrogen infrastructure basically doesn't exist and they can't take advantage of maybe what you might see in buses and trucks which operate in a fleet so they can always return to the same point to refuel. Uh, but yeah, it's very interesting because despite Stellantis discontinuing the operations and Toyota, Hyundai, Honda seeing, as you say, if we're being completely honest, very, very low numbers in sales, they still seem to be quite in on it if we're being like, I mean, Hyundai recently upgraded its Nexo. It has more hydrogen storage. It has a longer range than the previous version, and it's just got a massive facelift. Honda only released their fuel cell vehicle last year after having their Clarity discontinued in 2021. And Toyota, I think, also has the Crown, which is a fuel cell vehicle, which they sell only in Japan. It sounds like they're still sort of waiting for their turn to pounce and are developing that technology, and they seem to still have some hopes that it will be valid for passenger cars but the general consensus is that that's maybe not as as likely globally in the long term let's talk about buses a couple of years ago i did an interview with the uh, city of edmonton uh, transit manager and they were doing a pilot project with a couple of fuel cell buses hydrogen buses and the reason is they had quite a number of electric buses, but Edmonton's a northern city. You know, it gets 20, 30, even 40 below sometimes in the winter, and the, the electric buses didn't perform as well. And they had a problem with in electric infrastructure. The cost of upgrading for more buses was was exorbitant. So they were doing the, the hydrogen bus, and I think they lasted a year, maybe even less, and they, they abandoned it. It just it just wasn't practical, and I saw that as kind of a, a you know an example that I think is being repeated around the world that hydrogen buses are just are not catching on. Yeah, it's it's quite a weird one, isn't it? Because like you say, especially in these cold conditions, you wouldn't expect battery electric vehicles to to perform as well. And studies which we've seen consider that on a one to one substitution basis, they won't necessarily perfectly replace a combustion vehicle. Um, and I still think these advantages remain, but like you say, in terms of the cost of upkeep, and also uh, I'm sure that they may, may have had vehicle issues as well in terms of repair, which may have been problematic at the time. But I don't consider that maybe it's symbolic of how the, how the vehicle technology and infrastructure is right now. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it will not be it, like it will still be that way in five years or 10 years or 20 years in the future. Um, in your report, you talk about Ballard Fuel Cell, which is based in Vancouver. So a Canadian company, we're interested in that. Um, Ballard has seen its revenue grow in the, uh, in the first half of 2025. What's driving that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And I think from looking at what Ballard's results is that 
first of all, a lot of their transportation sales have been into heavy duty vehicles, which is as we would have expected. But compared to last year, I believe the, the trucks, their revenue has actually decreased and it's actually the buses that are driving it upwards. So from what we can tell is that fuel cell buses tend to, they seem to be, I guess, the go-to use case right now. And maybe it's similar to in Europe where a lot of countries are trialing fuel cell buses at the moment and hoping to make it part of their, not without obstacles, but making it part of their general public transportation system. Well, let's talk about uh, heavy trucks uh, because this was always, I think, the 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 case where uh, uh, hydrogen maybe made the most sense. Uh, hauling around batteries out on the highway for you know five hundred, six hundred, eight hundred kilometers a day uh, is very difficult, and yet uh, China, in particular, has begun electrifying its long haul fleet or switching it over to compressed natural gas. And hydrogen still just can't seem to get a toehold in that market. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to note that I guess the fuel cell fuel cell trucks are still selling in greater numbers year on year in China, but they're being outpaced by electric vehicles and natural gas, which and if you think about the amount of um, investing local governments and also the government in China in general has invested into hydrogen. You, may, you might consider this to be even the ideal scenario for them. And even then, they're sort of falling behind. Um, yeah, I guess what I would definitely say is it doesn't bode well for other people who want to be using hydrogen. But for countries that where hydrogen could be, I guess, a massive economic source of then they'd still want to be trying for hydrogen, which I believe is what, for example, Japan and Korea, why these OEMs are still so keen on it to begin with. Uh, there was a, a, about the same time that Edmonton launched launched its uh, bus trial, uh, the uh, Alberta um, you know Trucking Association launched a two vehicle uh, class eight truck trial between Calgary and Edmonton, which is about three hundred kilometers. And when they launched it, I was at the press conference and took a ride in a hydrogen bus or a hydrogen truck. And you can certainly see the advantages. It's very quiet, uh, you know, so operators uh, like it a lot. Uh, and it had lots of torque, you know, which is another yes. another advantage. Um, and you could see where it would, may, might be practical. You know, the, the big hydrogen tanks uh, were made out of, I think, out of carbon fiber or some composite material like that. So they weren't heavy the way fuel would be. Yes. Um, the problem is just getting them fuel. And that's such an onerous issue, converting something, you know, making the hydrogen and transporting it just seems to be, <clears throat> excuse me, the technical and economic problem that the industry can't get over. Yeah, 100%. And like, just to add on to that, I mean, hydrogen is denser energetically than you would have for like a massive battery, which is going to weigh a couple tons. It, it doesn't eat into the payload nearly as much as well. So there's plenty of reasons. And just like battery electric vehicles, they can generate that instantaneous torque, which is really important for trucks and heavy duty vehicles. So it really is a dependency on the infrastructure. But then you're sort of stuck with that chicken and the egg problem, aren't you? Where um, people say, I would love to have a hydrogen vehicle, but I don't have the infrastructure. But I can't build the infrastructure because we don't have a vehicle. So Yeah, in indeed. Uh, and you make a point in the report that industrial policy from, you know, key countries like China, maybe the United States, maybe the EU, uh, might be the thing that finally uh, builds out enough infrastructure that hydrogen trucks can take off. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I guess I'll speak about Europe here because I'm most familiar with that, but I'm aware that there's similar policies across globally, but the EU has it's sort of alternative uh, refueling infrastructure policy. And I believe that means that they will plan to build on the trans-European network, hydrogen refueling infrastructure every 100 kilometers, I believe. And then if you can actually build it up and have that reliable, reliable source running on these corridors, which are primarily used by all these vehicles, then this is pretty much, I'd say, the only shot that hydrogen really has to survive in transportation. And hopefully with that success can maybe come the later, more niche usage of like commercial vehicles or passenger cars. I mean, hydrogen, I'd still, you know, hydrogen, if it's produced by an electrolyzer, 
it's still great. The cars, I'm sure, run beautifully. And I wouldn't be opposed to getting a hydrogen vehicle in future if the infrastructure was there, as I'm sure a lot of people would agree. Uh, let's uh, end the uh, interview this way, John. Um, the On the battery electric side, uh, and again, China's leading here, but we're expecting uh, the first commercial solid state batteries to come out in 2028, 2029. And there they're expecting uh, two to three times the, the energy density of a lithium ion battery. So now you can use smaller batteries in those big trucks, makes them more viable. If that be, is an economic use case, and that remains to be seen, uh, then that pretty much is the death knell, I would think, for hydrogen, uh, hydrogen trucks of any kind. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to say so. I mean, lithium-ion batteries, which uh, have been the standard for a long time, traditional lithium-ion batteries, have improved incrementally year on year. And this has already eaten into the range of use cases where hydrogen is considered well, was considered to have an advantage over battery electric. So if solid state batteries can do as they promise, they can charge reliably and quickly and drive for these long cross-border trips, then the only thing you could say for hydrogen is for these very niche operations operated certain fleets with an on-site electrolyzer. And we just don't consider that to be, currently it's just not looking very good in that area. Well, John, uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for updating us on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.